seated. So we see here in uh, Proverbs chapter number 10, verse number 7, the Bible says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Obviously, the connotation here is talking about uh, uh, someone that has died. So when we're talking about someone that has died, that they are now a memory, they, they are no longer here on this present earth. And what the Bible is teaching and telling here in the book of Proverbs is the just man, his memory is something that's blessed. His memory is something that people look back on and say, wow, that's such an amazing man. He did so many good things. But then the antithesis to that would be, but the memory or the name of the wicked shall rot. Just like a, a, any anything, any organic matter that is left to itself that is for you. And here's the truth of the whole matter. Every person at some time will stand before the Lord God Almighty. And by yourself you will face the Lord. If you're saved, you'll go to a place called the uh, judgment seat of Christ, where you'll stand before your Savior and you'll answer for every one of your life's works, for every idle word that you have spoken, and Christ will judge your works that you have done. If you're unsaved, meaning you're lost, you don't know if you're going to heaven, you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you will stand before God at the great white throne of judgment. And once again, He will judge your life, and He will judge what you did, and the decisions you made, and determine that you did not take His Son to be your Savior. And in both of those areas, you'll find that you will have an epitaph given to you from God. That's what I want you to just think about this morning. I want to preach on this morning is the epitaph from God. You can see, because we, we all, every single person, you go to a grave or you go to an obituary, and you'll find there's an epitaph for that person. You know, a loving father, a tender mother, uh, and all these different things that will describe their life and try, and try and hone in on who this person was. And those are good and those are great, but the only one that really matters will be the epitaph from God. The words God will say, these are the words that describe you all charges. But still, that's how that saying comes about. And that's how these people are. Because of their wicked life, because of the wicked decisions that they made, their memory is something that's of a disdain. Their memory is something that people do not like to think upon. You know, you could choose anyone you want. You could choose some of the world's most heinous and wicked men that have ruled. You could choose men from the Bible. Ahab. Herod, men like that, these are wicked men, and we never think of them in a good light because they were wicked men. Men in our more recent times, okay, uh, Paul Pot, uh, Adolf Hitler. These are men that have wicked lifestyles, wicked decisions, and they're not thought of in a good way at all. Their memory has rotted. Their name has become destruction and something putrid. Whereas someone that is good, someone that spent their life doing what God would have wanted them to do, they have a memory that is blessed. They are someone that people think upon and say, that was an amazing person. They did so many good things with the life that they were given. So my challenge to you is what would be the epitaph from God for you? You see, if you go to uh, Dr. Jack Howe's grave, you'll see on his grave, his epitaph says, a soul winner. And he goes to his life verse, Daniel chapter 1. We'll stand before Christ. We'll answer for the works that we have done, and you will receive a new name. But, what that name means, the epitaph God gives you is entirely dependent upon you and you alone. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Which way would you fall? Which way would you land? Who are you, and what have you amounted to? What have you done for the cause of Christ to please and to serve God? What have you done to further the cause of Christ? See, those are the only things. The furthering the cause of Christ, working for God, serving God, those are the only things that will affect the epitaph from God. Anything else is of no use and of no consequence when God looks at your life and says, What have you done? For me, what will the epitaph of God be for you? Let's look at some of these. Let's look through our Bibles and look at some men that God said, this is the epitaph that I have given you. 
These are the words that I want people to remember you by throughout the generations, throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia. These are the words that I want you to be remembered by. Let's see. What are some of the things God has said about men? That is what God has decided for Moses to be known as throughout all of the history of mankind. Moses, my servant. Moses, one of the greatest leaders, one of the greatest men in all of human history. I mean, God himself said about it in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 10. He says, there is not a prophet like unto Moses since. Uh, you, you, won't, you won't be able to find a prophet like Moses in Israel like Moses. You can't. You won't. And that's from God himself. That, that's the type of man we're talking about here. We're talking about the meekest man of his day. That's what the Bible says about him. He's the meekest man. Meekness is strength under control. So the more meekness you have, it means the more strength you have. So the meeker you are, that means the more strength you are controlling. And he was able to lead millions of people. And for a time, he did it by himself. It wasn't until later on that he got that he got counsel from his father-in-law to set up the, the, the hierarchy and the bureaucracy of you're over these 50 and setting everyone up so he didn't have to hear all of it. So for a time, literally for millions of people, every single problem they had, every, every controversy there was among them, he heard it all and he made a judgment on every single one by himself. And Moses knew me face to face as the Lord knew him face to face. Just as we have a conversation face to face, just as we look each other in the face as we speak, that's the relationship Moses had with God. And God said, Moses, he's my servant. He's the man whom I trust. He's the man who if I wanted something done, that's the guy I would ask. That's who Moses is. Imagine having that epitaph from God. He's my servant. If I need something done, I know who I'm going to ask. It's Moses. Could God say that about you? I have a task that needs done and I have hmm, nobody to do it. Guys, knock it off. Shut up. You want to sleep? Go home. Moses, my servant. Could God say that about you? Ooh, or better yet, do you even want God to say that about you? Because there's a problem here. You have to have the heart being willing to be a servant. You see, the Bible says in the book of Philippians that Jesus Christ put upon him the form of a... So through what would God's epitaph be for me? The epitaph from God. When I stand before God, what are the words he will say to me? We've already seen what he said about Moses. Moses, he's my servant. There isn't a prophet like unto him. I knew him face to face. Abraham, James, chapter number 2, verse number 23. The Bible says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. That, that's, that's Abraham's epitaph. We have Moses. He is God's servant. But then you have Abraham. God said, that's my friend. That's, that's my friend. That's someone I, I get to talk to. That's one of the most unbelievable epitaphs God has ever given is saying, that is my friend. Friend. Remember, he's the God of wonders. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He, he's the ruler of all universe. And we are literally just small peons to him. We are, not, we are his creation. Hey, we're less than ants to whom God is. And he said, Abraham, that's my friend. Uh, he is my friend. One of the most amazing accounts in scriptures is watching the life and the growth of Abraham. Did he have it all together all the time? Absolutely not. In fact, a majority of the times you see Abraham, he's messing up in some way, shape, or form. When he's told to leave, he's told Abraham, leave everything. And he takes everything. Okay? He, he, leave your family. He takes almost his whole entire family with him. 
Okay, he brought his father, he brought uh, Lot, his nephew, and he brings all of his stuff. But we see every time God puts Abraham through a test, or every time God has Abraham go through another thing, he, he may fail it, but you see, he progresses every single time. He learned from his failures. He learned from his downfalls. And we see the culmination of that when he finally passed the faith test. When God told him, he says, Abraham, you need to give me your son, the son of the promise. The son he had waited literally the majority of his life for. Almost the entirety of his life, he had a promise from God that Abraham, I am going to make of you a great nation. You're going to have a son, and he is going to have a son, and he's going to have 12 sons, and there's going to be as the sand of the sea. And it was just through Isaac. And God told him, he says, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, I want you to go to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham, without a second thought, okay. You see, that didn't happen overnight. That was the decades of time that Abraham had learned to just trust God. Uh, Even if it doesn't make sense to me, I trust God. And as he was going up the mountain to sacrifice his own son, his son asked, he says, Father, I see we have all the stuff. We have all the supplies, but we don't have a sacrifice. And Abraham said, God will provide. You see, Abraham had learned, God's my friend. And I can trust him. It took me a while to get there, but I learned that I can trust God. And he gets up there and he gets all over the place. He ties him on the altar. He has a knife in the air. And right before he plunges it down, the angel of God stops him and says, Abraham, I know thou believest in me. And lo and behold, you look to the right, and there is a ram ready for sacrifice. His horn stuck in a thicket, just waiting there, ordained by God to be there at such a time as needed. Because Abraham had showed, I have learned to trust what God has told me to trust. He was the man that received the promise of God, that received the promise of a nation, the father of the people, the father of the children of Israel, the lineage of which the Redeemer would come to this earth. And God said, He's my friend. Could God say that about you? So we have Moses, a servant. Oh, and then we have Abraham, my friend. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. He said, Abraham, he's my friend. Abraham would do anything for me. The verse goes on to say, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. See, that's why I believe God says Abraham is my friend. Because Abraham will literally do anything that I ask of him. And God knows that because he did. The culmination of Abraham's life most likely at this time when God asked him and God told him to sacrifice Isaac, Isaac was probably 30 to 40 years old. And the pictures often it's this little boy. No, he's probably 30 to 40 years old at that time. Which also is a testament, Probably he's probably 33. That's just my belief. He was, and that's a testament to Isaac as well. I mean, Isaac's 33. He's probably in the prime of his life. I, I think he could have taken his father who was, you know, over 100 at the time. I think he would have had no problem. But he, okay, Dad, I trust you. And let his father tie him up, put him on the altar, and raise a knife in the sky about to stab him in the heart. I mean, that's a testament to both of them. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. Trust in my dad. Uh, 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 uh. Uh. You see, God said, Abraham's my friend because Abraham will do anything I ask of him. What's God's epitaph for you? Let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter number 9. Think 
about it. As we look through these men, as we look through our Bibles, what is? I want you to wrap your brain this morning and be honest. If I died right now, I stood before God Almighty, what would be the words he says about me? He says, you are what? What are you? Who are you? If that's not a challenging thought, then I really don't want to be you when you actually stand before God. Because if that's not a challenging thought to you, if that's not something that, 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 uh, that, that challenges you and that wants to change your life, then I really, honestly, I don't want to be you when you stand before God. Because if you don't care what God thinks about you, whew, the God of all things says, I know you. I know you better than you know yourself. Once again, the Bible tells us that God has the very hairs of our head numbered. That's how much he knows you. An insignificant fact that nobody cares about. And honestly, if somebody knew it about you, you'd be like, okay. But God says, that's how important you are to me. That even an insignificant fact that nobody cares about, I know that. And God says, you're going to stand before me. And you're going to answer for your life's work. And if you say, ah, I don't really care. I wouldn't want to be you. Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. Daniel 9, 23, the Bible says, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel. The old saying goes, dare to be a Daniel, a man unafraid to stand for what's right. A man unafraid to do what he knows God wants him to do. And this wasn't something that he, that he, he learned to do when in his old age. This just started when he was a young man. In a far off country, in a foreign country, mom and dad are nowhere to be seen, stolen away from his home. And he says, I will not defile myself with the king's meat. And the king's wine. Why? I am not supposed to drink this. I am not supposed to eat this. And it's a dietary law. You know, people all get, oh, you're so legalistic. Daniel said a dietary law. He wasn't allowed to eat pork. He says, I can't eat that. That's how important doing what God says was to Daniel. That's the man who was said about him, verse number 23, for thou art greatly beloved. What does it say in the text verse? Proverbs chapter 10, 7. The memory of the just is blessed. Does that mean everyone loved Daniel and everyone wanted to be like Daniel? Absolutely not. There were people that hated Daniel. There were literally men that tried to kill Daniel. They tried, they put hold, they had this whole controversy, this whole plan, so they could murder Daniel. In fact, Jesus Christ even warned us about it. John chapter 15, it says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore... The world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept me saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. See, Jesus Christ is warning, he's saying, if you do right, yeah, the memory of the just is blessed, but that doesn't mean you won't have people that despise you. And once again, he's saying, look, they don't despise you. They're despising me. The Lord is also saying in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs also says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There are people in this world who hate God and hate the very idea of God. Those are the ones that will hate you. But the biblical truth still remains the same. The memory of the just is blessed. The rulers, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, they loved 
Daniel. And in fact, the king that signed the decree that sentenced Daniel to the lion's den spent the whole night franticking and panicking because he knew he's the one that sent Daniel to the lion's den. And he would never be able to live with himself if Daniel did not survive. Why? Because Daniel was greatly beloved because of who he was and the stand he took. And he was going to always do what was right. Those princes that tried to have Daniel murdered, they scrutinized every action Daniel made. They looked over all the work he did, everything he signed off on, and they could never find anything that he did wrong. Because to him, his testimony was paramount. If he was willing to stand up and possibly even die for a dietary law, you know what kind of a man he is. He he stood up and said, look, I I cannot eat this. Understanding he's in a foreign country that just slew most of the people of Israel and took them all captive, he understood. Me standing up and saying this, they might just say, but he said it's worth it to do what God told me to do. So how about you? How is your testimony of others? Are you a greatly beloved? Or are you a name that will rot? Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. How is your epitaph coming out? How is it filling out? The epitaph from God. Oh, it's a serious matter. Acts chapter 13, verse number 22. The Bible says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony And said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. All the things David's life could have been summarized as. The giant slayer, the greatest king of Israel, the warrior of God, an amazing and loving shepherd. And God says all those things, those are good. But the thing that made him all those things is he was a man after my own heart. David's very life was infatuated with following and finding the heart of God. What God wanted was what David wanted. See, David desired more than anything to build the temple to God. That's what his heart was. And he said, how can I have an amazing palace? How can I have an amazing home? But God still lives. God only has a tabernacle. That's all God has. That's, in fact, when he was thinking about it. His house was being built. His palace was being built. And he said, whoa, this is out of order. We need to build the temple. And once again, to show you how in tune... And how in faithful and in step with God he was, God said, David, you're not building my temple. Why? Because you're a man of war. Well, God is the one that made him a man of war. David could have said, well, you, you're the one that told me to do this. You're the one that told me to, to fight for the people of Israel. And now because I did what you told me to do, I can't do this. No, he didn't say that. He said, well, I'll tell you what I will do. I'm going to get everything ready. So as soon as my son becomes king, the temple is being built. I mean, talk about a true man after God's own heart. If that were you or I, we'd be like, forget this. I had an idea. I wanted to do it. And because I already did what you told me to do, now I can't do what I wanted to do. That's that's our reaction. David desired the name and protect the name of God so much that when he was just a youth, a teenager, probably 16, 17 years old, he went and he fought against the hero of the Philistines, Goliath, 
a man that just stood under 10 foot tall, who had the massive spear, who was like a weaver's beam, which is like, you know, a beam of a building. That's how the, the, the trunk of the spear was. I mean, we're talking about a man who was almost 10 feet tall and who from his childhood was trained to fight. It's not like, oh, this is a big guy, let's put some armor on him. No, from a child, from a young child, like we had him go to school, he went to school to kill people. That's what he was trained his entire life to do. And David, no weapons except for his sling and five smooth stones he just picked up out of the creek, walking over to him. I mean, talk about having faith in God. He didn't even have the stones with him when he started to go towards Goliath. On the way, he's like, oh, that was good. That's how much he was after the heart of God as a youth, as a teenager. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. In fact, David had one of the worst sins shown in the Bible. He committed adultery, and then he murdered the husband, trying to cover his own sin up. And he probably lived in that turmoil for probably, we think probably about a year, maybe a year and a few months. In fact, you can see in some of the Psalms where it talks about he soaked his pillow with his tears. Because he knew he wasn't living the way he was supposed to. Because he's the man after God's own heart, and he knows he's not living the way he's supposed to. But see, here's the difference. This is what shows he's truly the man after God's own heart. When the man of God came and said, David, thou art the man. You are the one that's wrong, David. David immediately says, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, we have the opposite of that. Saul, the king right before him, when he is confronted with the things that he did, with the wrong that he did, he said, I, it's the people's fault. Ah, they made me do it. But David said, I sinned. I have done wrong. And even more showing his desire to follow the heart of God. What about Job? Job chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. And that's and then God said that exact same thing about him in verse number 8 when he's talking to Satan. God says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and assures evil. That's what God himself said about Job. Perfect and upright, fearing God and eschewing evil. I don't want anything to do with it. I abhor evil. That's what it means to eschew evil. I abhor it. I don't even want to be close to it. That's the epitaph of God for Job. Well, what about the Roman centurion that Jesus Christ came across in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 10? Jesus Christ had to say this, when Jesus heard it, the centurion, he had a sick servant, and Jesus Christ, uh, he, he stopped Jesus Christ and he said, my servant is sick. I need your help. I know who you are, and I know the power you have. And Jesus Christ said, okay, show us where he's at. Lead the way. And he says, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my roof. And I know the power you have. You don't even need to go close. You just say the word, and he's healed. And then Jesus had to say this. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. He was astonished. And said to them that followed, his disciples and everyone that was with him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Ah, that's an epitaph from God. The cent Roman centurion. We don't even know his name. We just know he was a centurion. Not so great a faith. I mean, that's some pretty amazing faith. When God says about you, that's the greatest faith I have seen, and it's not even a Jew. It's not even an Israelite. Someone that's had the prophecy of the Messiah for their entire life. 
for them before the nation of Israel was even a nation. They had the prophecy of the Messiah coming. And Jesus Christ says, that's the greatest face I've seen. What an epitaph. Cornelius, Acts chapter number 10. It describes Cornelius as a devout. He was, an, he was another centurion. He was a devout man that feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people and prayed to the God, prayed to God always. A just man, a good report among the Jews. That's, that's saying something. When a Roman centurion had a good report among the Jews, that meant you were a fantastic man. Because the Jews hated, hated the Romans. They despised them. They, they wanted nothing to do with them. Right. So for a Roman centurion to have a good report among the Jews, that meant he had to be a pretty fantastic man. And we see that there. That's the epitaph God has left for him, for us, in his word. Could you imagine God saying that about you? What about Timothy? 1 Corinthians 16 says, that, uh, says Now if Timothy has come, See that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. That's an epitaph. The, yeah, Timothy, he does the work of God just like Paul does. Hey, stop. He does the work of God just like Paul does. One of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest Christians in the Bible, and God, and God says, yeah, Timothy, he, he's like Paul. That's who he is. He does the work of the Lord like Paul does. In Colossians 4, we're given a list of all these different men that Paul is listing to the church of Colossae, saying, hey, there's this guy over here, and there's this guy over here. A guy named uh, Tychicus. He's a beloved, this is how he's described, a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave. A slave that got saved and changed his life. And Paul describes him as this. He's a faithful and a beloved brother. Paul trusted him so much that he gave him a letter to take back to his own master. That's how much Paul trusted Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. A man by the name of Justice. He's a fellow worker and a comfort unto me. That's what Paul had to say about him. He's a comfort unto me. Epaphras. The Bible says he, has a, he was a servant of Christ, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. A prayer warrior. That's what Paul is trying to say. He's a prayer warrior. Every time he's praying, he is fervently praying for you. He has a great zeal for you. Mark, John Mark. Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul says he is profitable to me for the ministry. This is the same John Mark that the first time he went out, he faltered and failed and ran away. The same one that was a hurt to the ministry, now Paul is saying about him, he is profitable to the ministry. Imagine God saying about you, he is profitable to the ministry. Boys, hey, stop it. Luke, the beloved physician. And Paul also said of Luke, he's the one that's with me. He says, only Luke is with me. He's the one that's stuck by me. He's the, he's the one I can trust to be with me throughout this whole thing. Onesiphorus. Very little is known about Onesiphorus, but if he was someone, he was someone that was a great companion to Paul. This is what Paul had to say about him in 2 Timothy. He says, he has oft refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. This is when Paul was in prison, when he was under house arrest. He said, he wasn't ashamed of my chain. He sought me out very diligently and found me. He found out I was in prison in Rome, and he found out where I was, and he came to help me. He was a friend to Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Bible has to say about Paul, he says, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. That's God speaking. God said, Paul is a chosen vessel. I have specifically chosen Paul for this job. 
I have a job specifically set for the Apostle Paul. Jesus Christ. John 8, 29 says, I do always those things that please Him. Talking about the Father. Jesus Christ says, what do I do? I do everything that pleases God. Oh, what did we also say? It also said, he who walked about doing good. That's who Jesus Christ was. Enoch. Talk about an epitaph from God. And Enoch walked with God. That's what we know about Enoch. He walked with God. We don't have any other details about when he was off this earth, besides the age that he was when he was no longer on this earth. Besides that, we just know he walked with God. God was so important to him that he walked with God always. How does your epitaph look? Has this been encouraging or has it been a realization of how short and how fall we have lived up to? Those have all been good epitaphs that God has given. But the Bible is not just full of the good epitaphs. There's also a warning of the bad epitaphs. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17 says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Imagine being known as that for all the rest of human history. The profane fornicator. The profane man. That's who Esau is known as. That's God's epitaph for you. You're a profane fornicator. Wow. That's not quite the, uh, that's not the lineage. That's not the name you want. Once again, Proverbs 10, 7, blessed or rocked. What side will it be? Just man is blessed. The wicked man, his name will rock. Are you an Esau? When God says you, would he say a fornicator and a profane person, a wicked man? Psalm 78, 9 says, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, they are ready for the battle. They turn back in the day of battle. God, God has armed you. He's prepared you. He's given everything you need. You're, you're, you're in a church that preaches right. You're in a church that wants to do what God wants you to do. And the day of battle comes and you turn back. You will stand before God. And will he say that about you? I gave you everything you needed to be a successful Christian. And when the time came, you turned back. That's what the children of Ephraim are known for. Armed and ready. And they turn back in the day of battle. The time that God had prepared them for, and they fell. 2 Timothy 4.10 For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Oh, how about that? God has put you in the place you're supposed to be. You're working for the Lord, but the love of this present world. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, I want to do that. This is what's important to me. And you forsake the very God that gave you all those things. The very God that gave you everything that you have. The very God that gave you the breath in your lungs. And you have forsaken him for the pleasures of this world. That's who Demas was. Oh, 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. Holding faith. This is what we had to do. We had to hold faith in a good conscience. Which some, having put away, talking about they put away their faith, they no longer hold their faith like they used to. Concerning faith have made shipwreck. They made a shipwreck of their lives. That's the epitaph these two men have. Hymenius and Alexander. That's how they're known to history. Men that made shipwrecks of their lives. And Paul goes on to say, he said, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. What is Paul trying to say? Paul's saying, I understand they've done wrong, and they need to learn what they did was wrong. I am not going to save them from the hard times that are coming because they need to learn not to blaspheme. 
They made a shipwreck of their lives. They damaged the cause of Christ, and they have to learn not to blaspheme. That's who I mean. It's not different. Would that be the thing you let God to say about you? You made a shipwreck of your life because you didn't hold fast to the faith. That's how they made a shipwreck, holding faith. And just to make sure we understood, he said, some having put away concerning faith. Let's make sure we're all understanding this. They put away the faith, and they made a shipwreck of their lives. Will those be the words God says about you? These all have applied to Christians. Some, you could apply to those that are unsaved, those that are lost. But let's look at specific ones that God has already said in His Word about the unsaved. I want us to go to Acts chapter 26. What are the words what God would say about you if you fulfill your life's journey and you never accept Christ as your Savior? You never settle where your eternal home will be. What will God say about you? Which one of these would be the end epitaph from God for your life? Acts 26, 28 says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Can you imagine being Agrippa when he stands before God? And he says, Agrippa, the words I remember about you, almost persuaded. Thou almost persuaded me. Paul, he almost did it. And he will stand before God Almighty and answer for those words. Would that be you? I've heard the gospel. I've heard about Jesus, but I just have some other questions. And there are just so many religions in this world that I'm just not quite sure about. Almost persuaded. For all of eternity, Agrippa is going to regret those words. Those words are going to live in his memory forevermore. Almost persuaded. What a fool. What a fool. Mark chapter 10, 22. Almost persuaded. Would that be the epitaph God has for you, lost person? Almost persuaded. Let's look at another one. Mark chapter 10, verse 22. What's God's epitaph for you, lost man? Lost sinner who hasn't had time for God. I don't have time to, to ask God to be my, to ask Christ to be my Savior. I don't have time for that. Will you be the almost persuaded? Or how about this, Mark 10, 22. The rich young ruler. Jesus Christ just told him, yeah, I got to do, you know. Uh, he comes to Christ and says, what must I do to have eternal life? And he says, I, 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 the rich young ruler says, I, I've kept all the commandments of God. All these have I kept from my youth. And Jesus Christ, knowing he's a rich man, says, okay, give up all you've got. And serve me. Follow me, just like the disciples. Give up everything you got and become one of my disciples. And this is what the rich young ruler's response was. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Are those the words God is going to epitaph your life with? He had great possessions. I would get saved, but I've got so much stuff going on in my life. I've got this or that. I want to do this. I, I want to do that. That's what's important to me. What are the words God's going to look at you? Look in the eyes, and you'll be by yourself. It's not going to be some great mass of people all around. No, no, you're, you're going to stand by yourself before God Almighty at the great white throne of judgment, and He's going to say, these are the words you spoke. These are the actions you did. And these are the words that I give you. Almost persuaded, Agrippa. Rich young ruler, you had too many things. They were just too important to you. 
Let's go to Matthew chapter number 7. What else would it be that God epitaph for you would be? The epitaph from God. What is it going to be, lost person? Almost persuaded, Agrippa. Rich young ruler, I had too many things. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, talking about the judgment day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. We've done all this. We've done it in your name. And then I will, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Will those be the words God says to you? You have a grip. I'm almost persuaded. The rich young ruler, I have so many possessions. But then the good man, he's a good guy. I look at all the things I've done. I never knew you. Will those be the words that God sentences your life with? I never knew you. And you'll be cast. You will stand before God. And his epitaph for you is entirely dependent upon you. It's your choice. That's the amazing thing of God, is God has literally given us all the power in how our lives will be summarized by him. He's given us every opportunity to be exactly what we want it to be. And it's up to us. So what's it going to be, lost person? Are you going to be almost persuaded. Or are you going to be, I I had so many things. I I lived a good life. I never knew you. Lost person, you have one choice. That's accept Christ. Other than that, your epitaph, it's going to be pretty bad. It's going to be the worst words you ever hear spoken. Your epitaph from God, if you stand before him as a lost person. Right. See, the Bible says he is waiting. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted, accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're here this morning and you do not know, you say, you know, those, those words could explain my life. I, you know, I, I've heard the gospel, but I don't know about it. I haven't studied all the religions of the world yet. Oh, you know, I have so many things I'm trying to do. Or maybe I'm just a good guy. I, I, don't, I don't need to do that. I'm a good person. I've done so many good works. What will God say about you, lost person? I never knew you. Depart from me. All oh, the Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says, The Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some mountain count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. That, that's God. All should come to repentance. Jesus Christ says, I am here that everyone can get saved. Amen. Agrippa, I, I wish you were persuaded. Rich young ruler, I wish you gave up your possessions. Good person, I wish you didn't depend on what you did. But the decision is ours to make. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Lost person, choice choice is yours. What is it going to be? Two more verses and we're done. Back to the Christian. Ultimately, your epitaph will be in one of two categories. We started with Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Matthew 25, 26. Matthew 25, 26. Christian, 
what will be your epitaph? What will it be? Matthew 25, 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Or, Matthew 25, 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How will God summarize your life? How will you be remembered? If you're lost, you have one choice. There is no other choice. That's it. This is the choice you have. Don't even worry about what God's going to think of your life. If you are lost, it's already determined. That's your choice. But Christian, we went through so many different men and so many different epitaphs. Which one would you be? And ultimately, we have the ending conclusion. Is God going to look at you and say, Thou wicked and slothful servant. I gave you so much, and you did so little. Or will God look at you and your epitaph be, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The epitaph from God. What will it be for you? Let's pray. Dear Father, I beg of you.